everybody. Welcome to the SoxProspects.com podcast. We are the web's number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system from top to bottom, from Fort Myers to Pawtucket and all stops in between. Thank you for listening. My name is Chris Hatfield, and I am the executive editor of SoxProspects.com, joined, as always, by our director of scouting, Ian Cundell, who has not... Well, we won't go there. Um... Who is joining me as always from his? Is that your bedroom? Technically, I I, I always. Uh, I'm in my background. office. You're in your office. Okay. Yes. Uh, Ian, it's January. Not a lot has happened yet, but we're going to talk today about things that might be. Yeah, I mean, the odds are we're going to record this, and then like tomorrow before it gets put out, the right. thing we're going to talk about happens, and then we'll release it anyway, and then record again tomorrow night. But yeah, right. Right. So uh, what we're going Yeah, what we're going to do today is we're going to play fantasy GM, not like fantasy baseball GM, but pretend GM. And uh, using mlbtradevalues.com, we simulated some trades. Uh Ian took the Padres, I took the Dodgers to see what a Mookie Fifi the Cat didn't take either. Uh and we're going to take a look at what some trades with either of those teams might look like in a Mookie bet deal. It sounds Ian like trade rumors are are starting to percolate a little bit. Yeah, I, 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 I we should talk in general about this the Mookie Bet situation. I think a little more because I tweeted out something that I didn't think was very controversial, and I got a lot of pushback yesterday. Yeah, um, we can we can get into that. I think. Yeah, I didn't respond because obviously other things were happening mm-hmm. that were made it seem pretty not relevant. Right. So. Right. Which I'm sure we'll mention in a second. We'll I'm sure. Yeah. First, but, we want to we yeah. give a sh- yeah. First, we want to give a shout out to our five dollar level Patreon supporters. If you want to support the podcast, you can go to patreoncom prospects. You can sign up to um, give a certain amount per episode, and based on the amount you give per episode, you get certain perks. And we want to thank all of our patrons, but especially our five dollar per episode supporters. That'd be Kyle Costigan, Tyler Woodrow, Jeff Trainer, Def- David Nardone. Tim Harding, Bill Stanton, Deb Kendall, Evan Kirkwood, Hurricanes 1, Chris Fox, James O'Hara, Nathan Kennan, Andrew Wallen, David B., Ben Burnett, Al Mendel, Kevin Catrides, Ben NRI, and Gerardo Ian Tosca. Um, to those last two guys, sorry I didn't have you, at least on the last episode. I didn't, like I said, I didn't have access to Patreon yet because we've got 2FA on it, and I didn't have the second factor until recently. So um, thank you to all of our supporters. Um, also, we should probably give a shout out. You may have noticed. Um, missing on that list was Sox Signatures. We want to give a shout out to Brian over at Sox Signatures, who's been a supporter of the website and the podcast for a long time. He uh, closed up shop uh, at the turn of the year um, to focus on other stuff. So thank you to Brian for his support for a long time as one of kind of our longtime supporters, especially on Patreon and otherwise. Um, and as we like to say always, send your emails to podcast at SoxProspects.com. We want to talk about what you want to hear about. So um, send your emails in. And actually, I should probably check at some point while we're recording this in whether we have uh, emails because I think we have at least one. We do have one from a patron, so we'll get to that. Um, but first, uh, one thing we should probably just get right at the jump here, and um, we're recording this on Monday the 27th. Um, yesterday, of course, was the uh, helicopter crash that most is most noteworthy for um, taking the life of Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna, um, but of course there were there were seven other people on the helicopter, and among them were the father, sister, and stepmother uh, of Red Sox scout JJ Altabelli, um, who is based out of California. Um, obviously, a, a terrible tragedy uh, for him and the rest of his family. Um, so we want to send our deepest condolences from the website, uh, from all of us at Sox Prospects, to the Altobelli family. Um, if you follow us on Twitter, we both have retweeted. The Red Sox have set up a GoFundMe page um, to help the family out uh, at this time. Um, you know, I, I just got done talking about supporting the podcast, and th- that's well and good. And, and we appreciate the support of everyone who does. Um, but, you know, at, at times like this, um, you know, it's a good time if you've got, you know, some spare cash handy. Um to be able to, you know, if, if, if you're able to help support some folks in need at this time, that'd be a great way to do it. Um, so, you know, check both of our Twitters. Um, Ian's at Ian Cundall. That's I-A-N-C-U-N-D-A-L-L. I'm at SP Chris Hatfield. And actually, you can just, I think it's on at Red Sox now. Uh, I think they tweeted it, Ian. I know Paul yeah, Taboni had, had tweeted it earlier, but. 
Yeah, and he's someone we both have met before. It's he's the, the amateur director of scouting, so it's coming from a reliable source. Yeah, so, yeah. well, they, yeah, and the team tweeted it, and they actually sent it in their press release this afternoon. It, exactly. So if you're able to consider helping out the Altabelli family, and again, you know, deep condolences to JJ. Um, has been a scout, full time scout with the club for a year. He was a part time scout in 2018. Um, I'm only aware of one player that he signed this past year off the top of my head, and that was Chris Murphy. So that was a heck of a find. Pretty good find, yeah. Um, so promising future for him, played baseball at Oregon. His dad was the longtime coach at Orange County College in California. Um, really respected in that community, played at Houston. Um, if I, coach, I coach on the Cape League, too. Coached it for the Brewster Whitecaps for a yeah. couple of years. Coached Aaron Judge, um, who was the second baseman. Jeff, Jeff McNeil. McNeil. Jeff McNeil. Um, yeah. So very respected throughout the game. Um, and J.J., of course, on his way to you know maybe making a career in the game as well that, you know, who knows if it'll get to that point. But, um, again, our condolences to the Altabelli family. Um that's and everyone, everyone uh, and all the other families that were of, of course. Yeah, I mean the Bryants and the other families. I mean, just yeah. a terrible tragedy. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, we're going to try and talk baseball. <laughs> yep. um, no, no, really, no smooth way to transition yeah. from that. Um, really quick, Ian. Let's look at some some stuff that's happened since the, since the last episode, and that um, mm-hmm. was the Red Sox war on the name Travis. Um, as part of stockpiling, it looks like they're stockpiling arms. Ian really is what's happening. Yeah. Um, the Red Sox acquired it's a very raised move, let's be honest. It is. It really is. They acquired left hander, I think, Jeffrey Springs. Um, yep, from the Texas Rangers. And they acquired um left hander Matt Hall from the Detroit Tigers. Um Springs was acquired for the um recently outrighted Sam Travis. So he had cleared. Um so Travis traded to Texas for Jeffrey Springs, who Springs, I think, had been DFA'd, right? So um, Sam Travis, gone, uh, former second rounder, uh, of course, reached his high. I didn't realize he'd, he'd reached as high as number three in our rankings. Yeah, the system is terrible, then. Well, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> it was. I think, I think the, the top prospect at that time wasn't bad, um, but was he was Devers. the second rounder in 2014. Um the, the, let's see. Sam it was Devers. I'm almost positive. Yeah, I think it was Devers. Yeah, it was Dev at the time. It was Devers, Groom, and Travis. Yeah, um, it was a bad the, system after that. The well, and it was Travis, Shavis, Hauk, Mata, Akami. But it, that was before. That was after Shavis was coming off the injured year. Hauk. Mm-hmm. It was not a very deep system. Like it you get wasn't. down to ten, and we're talking like Jalen Beeks, Brian Johnson, Travis Lakins. Like yeah, and then, I mean they drafted Hauk. Side. That was right after Hauk got drafted. Cole Brandon at fourteen. Oof. Um. But yes, Travis gone. Uh, also, part of that move was Bobby Pointer being designated for assignment. He cleared and was outright at Pawtucket. Um, the Red Sox also outrighted Marco Hernandez to Pawtucket. Um, no, not again. We went over this last episode. Oh yeah, whatever. I'm going to say again, but not um, again. No, when they acquired Austin Bryce, Hernandez was DFA as as we talked about on the last episode. Um, Hernandez cleared and was outright at Pawtucket. Right. Um, so we were wrong on that. We thought he might get scooped, but he didn't. No. Um, and then, of course, the Red Sox acquired Matt Hall, another left-hander from Detroit. Um, was he DFA'd too? I think mm-hmm. he was DFA'd too. Yep. Um, and they traded double-A catcher John Nunez. Um, yeah. Nunez is a guy we've talked about on here. I, I think he's kind of kicked around in the 40 to 60 range of the rankings. Yeah, he's like – I think he was re-signed as a minor league free agent this offseason he too. He was. That's true. He but – Nunez to me like he's athletic you know he can play defense a little bit but at the end of the day I don't think the bat's there to be a big leaguer so it's more just like he's an up and down down a profile at best most likely just a solid organizational catcher right and they've shown like they can go out and get Jet Jeff or Jet Bandy Jesus I'm gonna screw that up I already said that Jet Bandy and Juan Centeno like yeah. That's like the kind of role he projects in. You can find those guys on the street. Like, yeah. I mean, Centeno did resign recently. That's the most recent transaction. Yeah. Uh, he was a minor league free agent. Um, in that move, uh, Travis Lakins was designated for assignment. This, was inter- I think we should t- this is interesting to me because <laughs> well, let's, let's get to what happened, and then you, you can talk about what I know you're going to talk about. But Travis Lakins designated for assignment. He's currently our number 30 prospect. 
Um, yeah, we can. T- I have a and and so yeah. he was then traded to Chicago for a player to be named later. The Cubs, sorry, the Chicago Cubs for a player to be named later or cash. We don't know what they're going to get in return for him. Um, that doesn't mean it's nothing. It, yeah, I mean, it wasn't like Marco Hernandez was a player to be named later, right? Was the he? Felix Dubon trade, yeah, the Dubon. So it can be something. Um, but that said, I would, it's, I don't expect it to be Marco Hernandez level. No, um, I, I wonder if it's, can you, I don't know if you can do this. Could it be like contingent on whether or not he like makes the Cubs out of camp or something? <sighs> can it be like you pick from this list if he does? And do you if still have six cash? months to do a player to be named later or did they I cut think that so. time? I think it's out. six months. It was six months, but I don't oh, know if they, they cut might that have changed it the draft the thing. Turner yeah. Rule. Let me Google it. I'll look up the CBA It might right be now. three months now. Um, but at any rate, yeah, I, I mean, that would still give you enough time to know whether or not he made the team. So that that's actually a good call. I hadn't thought of that. Um, because I know there was a point at which you could do that. No, it's six months. Oh, no, is that's it? December 2014. No, that's after Trey Turner, so it is six months. Are you looking months. at Cub Reporter? Uh, CBS Sports, but yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Cub Reporter is usually a really good source for that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, no, I, that that was my guess was that it had to do with that, was that right. like – if he makes the team, they'll get. They can pick from this list. If he doesn't, it might be cash, or you pick from this list, like something along those lines. If he gets DFA'd and they, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. If he gets DFA'd and clears well, waivers, <laughs> exactly. But I mean, with Lake, that, that like, sense. with Lakins, we should probably talk about. We had him at number thirty. It was a flimsy thirty because, as we talked well, about, the system isn't very deep. And frankly, from like twenty to. 55 you could make them in any order more or less sure yeah like to me like i don't think there's that it's not a the difference i'll say between like i would say where's the cutoff for me uh at like 17 more likely 15 but like this 15 to 17 range there's a tier and then after that maybe you can extend it down to 20 but after that it's just who it's whatever so i i don't like he, I don't think he was. Thir- I think I had him lower than that. Maybe we all, we all am all in that range though. But I honestly think it came down to just. I don't think they think Lakins can stay healthy. It's possible. I mean, that's like, possible. I mean, the, the problem with him last year is he he, we, he showed up to show out of shape, not of shape. Yeah, um, be, we can be frank about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, we we already have been. Yeah, um, and he just didn't really have a good year in part because of it. the stuff backed up a little bit. I do you know how high he got in our rankings without looking? That- Seven, six, six. Yeah. yeah, I had forgot about that back when he was a, a starter prospect. Because he had that really good, like, yeah, good showing. It, uh, where is it? Salem in seventeen. He came out just firing on all cylinders. But yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it just shows that this is kind of what we need to expect. And I, I think it's going to have me reevaluating relief only prospects in the system and how I rank them going forward because it's clearly they're employing the raise, churn, and burn method, where it's you just keep cycling them through the back end of the roster until someone sticks. Yeah. And like, that's what they're going to do. That's how the Rays found like Chaz Rowe, um, Emilio Pagan, like all their back end yeah. guys for the most part came from just like DFA guys. They got or small right. trades like Nick Anderson, another one, or like they well, traded Nick on, Anderson's different. Nick Anderson, Nick Anderson was a legit pro. Yeah. But like they, they traded know. like Nick Solak for Peter Fairbanks. who's like projects as like a seventh inning reliever. Like, Right. That they just use them as like they're just you know they're re, they're renewable resources basically one goes out another one comes in and just keep it going and right. so that's kind of what we're seeing with as you said you know they're cycling through lefties right now and let's be honest the forty man roster was pretty imbalanced in terms of there were way too many right handed relievers and in terms mm-hmm. of left handed relievers on the forty man there weren't that many and in the system no. there aren't that many. So, well, I mean you had Pointer who got DFA'd, but Pointer's but fungible. Point is whatever, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, he cleared that. Right. No, I'm just thinking in terms of prospects, though, because like, let's just even look at our projected team. You look at the Portland bullpen. There's not a single lefty we have projected there to make the team. You go to the Pawtucket bullpen. Every single one of them, except for pointers, guys that were acquired this year. Yeah. Josh Oshich, um, Jeffrey Springs, Matt Hall, Matt Hall except Parker for pointer. pointer. Yeah. Um, depends on and, how you count Brian Johnson. Yeah. And then you but I know I said I said in the bullpen, though. Well, but I mean, Johnson could be in the bullpen. Oh, you're That's right. Yeah, saying. but I, but then you get down to Salem and you see they have a ton of lefties, but none of those guys are close enough to big league ready to matter this year. So, yeah, like Ibar, I mean, exactly. Ibar and maybe Browning are the two. Libero too. I know they like him, but he just yeah. gets lefties out because he's funky. 
But yeah, I mean, it, they just don't have a lot of lefties in the high minors. So that's what they seem to be using their roster shots for. I guess the thing that just was a little surprising to me is that I don't know what Ryan Weber. Yeah, I don't get it. I, I, I mean, they clearly see something because he survived several rounds of cut, of DFAs now. But it just surprised me a little bit as like he's a 29 year old journeyman. And he's getting capped over like someone like Lakins, who, yeah, well, his prospect stock has fallen, was considered a reasonable enough prospect that it wasn't just us who had him in the top thirty. Like, you yeah, know, he was in he was in BA's top thirty for a few years. He was in MLB's top thirty when they. He, I think he was twenty four on MLB's list when he got traded. Like, yeah, well, look at the guys who they've DFA'd already this off. I mean, even just this month, Sam Travis. Um, let's see, Sam Travis, Marco Hernandez, like we just talked about, Brian Johnson. Well, Brian Johnson wasn't this. I'm saying this this month. Uh, this Bobby month. Pointer, yeah. Travis Lakins, yeah. I mean, granted, three of them cleared. Uh huh. So, I mean, they're not wrong, but it's like Ryan Weber would clear, man. Yeah, but maybe not. Who knows? And he's out of options too, so he has to make the team. I'm almost positive. Yeah, Weber is out of options. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I, the only thing I can think of with that is maybe they think that they have a better chance of getting those guys through because Weber's out of options. Maybe they think they can sneak him through. Like, you know, you know, when teams cut guys right at the deadline and hope that other teams have already claimed people. That's the only thing I can think of. But, but why? Yeah, I don't know. The fact that Weber doesn't have options makes him less likely to be claimed. Oh, OK. Yeah. So I don't know. It's just interesting. Because if a guy's got options, they, you, if you claim him, you can just option him. Well, no, no, I know. My point is, though, that maybe they think that, like, another team would claim him right now and try to, you know, see what they've got in spring training versus if they wait until teams have their 25-man roster set, more or less, you're unlikely to claim him unless he's replacing someone on your 25-man. Yeah, that's fair. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah. later, in, later in spring training, the fact that he doesn't have options becomes a, a detriment to claiming him if you've already exactly. got a full bullpen. Exactly. Whereas if you want to bring them in and then, you know, throw spaghetti against the wall and see if he wins the, you know, 12th, 12th 26th player or 25th right. player. Yeah. Right. I, and this is a side note, but one thing I think that is interesting too is, and I don't know if this is, would have happened if Dombrowski was still here, is the AAA team looks so much better than it did last year. <laughs> like, well, the bullpen is full to the brim i mean we've got guys that they just, just signed like, getting cut they, they've done what we've talked about that they're getting those like mm-hmm. priority free agents with major league experience guys like you know tommy joseph was a was well, a joseph was Phillies. last year yeah but yeah but like tommy joseph john andrioli has some experience in the big leagues well um, the, the two that stand i mean i mean i know nick longy had interest from other teams um i know that um i'm sure jeremy well, profar did yeah, Longy, Marco Hernandez, they got back, but Jet Bandy had has been in the big leagues. A free agent for two days. Yeah, but like I don't know, it was just interesting to me that they've got they've got a much deeper like AAA team than past years. Yep. So, yep. Anyway, should we move on to what people really want to hear about? Sure. All right, Ian. So, so Mookie Betts. Mm-hmm. We we've discussed this on the podcast before, but I think we need to kind of start from scratch again. Well, because um, like it was yeah. quiet for a while. It, was like it quiet. looked like nothing was going to happen. And we, then, we had come to the conclusion that he was probably not going to be moved. Until the deadline at the earliest, yeah. Well, just because the, the return is not going to we, – we projected that the return would not be commensurate with losing and, a year of Mookie Betts. Yeah. Um, again, the backdrop. Mookie Betts is going to make $27 million this year on a one-year deal, and then he will be a free agent. He has expressed that he has no desire to sign any kind of extension and wants to test the free agent market. The reason they are doing this, okay, is not just the get under the CBT thing. Whether or not they had that mandate, they would still be considering trading Mookie Betts. And the reason is because you are better off getting something for him than having him walk and getting nothing. Well, you get the 75th pick, I think, around there. Well, that's the thing. The pick that they would get, well, it depends on whether or not they go over the CBT is the other thing, too. If well, he but stays, if they keep him, I can't be... imagine they get under the CBT. At this exactly. Point. Because if they could have moved David Price at this point, they would have. Right? I mean, if they could have moved Jackie Bradley, I don't think they've ever really explored moving Jackie Bradley. It, it, I, I, My theory on Bradley is that they miscalculated the trade market there. 
And I wonder if they would, if they'd known there would be, it seems not little to no interest in him in a trade that they would have just not tendered him and tried to bring him back on a cheaper deal. Mm, maybe. Cause I just, I just think 11 million for him is a little pricey, but yeah, I mean, it is, it is pricey. That's so, for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, so anyway, let's, I mean, you had points you wanted to make on this. So why don't you just go ahead? I'll, well, no. So I, I tweeted something on Monday or Sunday that I didn't think was very controversial. I thought it was something that pretty much everyone would be able to like, would agree with in that. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that there are articles coming out about the Mookie Betts trade talks intensifying, which is why we're talking about this. We had Alex Spears reported some, that they're ongoing the, out of San Diego. There's a lot of fire coming out. Um, the yeah. L.A. guys have jumped in. Ken Rosenthal has jumped in. So there, when, and it's usually when you've got like reports coming from multiple different camps, it probably means they're pretty deep in negotiations or the, I mean, or at least they're exploring things. Well, this, so here's the difference, right? Team A and Team B has have talked just means that they've talked. Yeah, but these are more but than then, just talks. Well, that's what I'm saying is then it yeah. persists. Yeah. That means more than the talking, right? So the initial yeah. thing that they had talked could just mean that they've discussed it. But then it was like, I mean, there was a report out of San Diego that they've more or less agreed. And I don't know that I agree with this report because it doesn't I mean, seem like make names. sense. Yeah. They've agreed on names and they're just haggling over how much of Will Myers' contract will be paid by right. the Padres. Exactly. So, but like we have, I think we have a decent idea of what the Red Sox are looking for now. But the thing is, like, I don't think anyone disagrees that whatever you do with Mookie Betts trade, you're going to be worse in 2020, right? I don't think there's anyone who would argue that. There's no, that's the most non controversial statement ever. No one's saying they're doing this to get better in 2020. The baseball case for it is that in 2021 and beyond, when Mookie Betts is a free agent and not on your team, under team control, it strengthens your prospects of remaining competitive. I didn't think that was a controversial statement. Because just to be clear what you just said because of the word choice you use. Prospects of being competitive, you don't mean like players who are prospects. You mean no, I, no, no, the I team's mean, capability to be competitive correct, afterwards. For, correct. Just, just clarifying. Yes, that's what I mean. The team's ability to be competitive is stronger in 2021 and going forward if they trade Mookie Betts now. And – when I, when I said that, I was going to follow up, but as we talked about earlier, some stuff happened, so I didn't get a chance to. But on, like, if they trade Mookie Betts now, they're getting something for him. We know what the return is. If they don't trade him, as you said, they're getting the – let's assume it's the 75th pick because there's no way they're getting under. But right. that's a little weirder because they also, I think, would lose 10 spots in the first round and their fourth round pick because they're over the tax. I No? Just the 10 spots in the first round? I don't think that they would be over the second season. Oh, okay. They weren't this year, so I don't know why they would be next year. Good point. Um, But anyway, so they would would pick up a pick that's worth, I don't know, what's the 75th pick worth? Like 800K about? 900K? I'm looking right now. Uh, It's, okay, so 69 was 1.1 million. So it's around a million, let's say. So you're picking up about a million dollars in cap money. Not, Not, it's not nothing, but... It's not what you could get in a trade, even at a depreciated market value, which let's be honest, Betts has because he said he's not signing an extension, as you alluded to, and it's a one-year deal. So he's a pure rental. Well, and as has been discussed with one of the trade partners, potentially, the Padres have a tradable draft pick. A very nice tradable draft pick, right. which would be higher than any pick the Red Sox made this year, for example. <laughs> like, right. so, but but that, 20, but yeah. No, 30, 30, 35. Five, okay. Yep, continue. But, so anyway, but my point is that I thought by if you trade bets, the guys you're getting back are going to be able to help you more immediately than any draft pick you get back for him. And so thus, it increases your chance of remaining competitive. And pretty much almost every response was something along the lines of, no, it doesn't. It's their two owners are too cheap. You just pay him the money, blah, blah, blah. I, and what I think people need to realize is just because if the Red Sox offer Mookie Betts $350 million, he is under no obligation to sign with the Red Sox. There's the nothing people miss. Like just because the Red Sox offer him the money doesn't mean he has to take it or want to take it. Like yeah. we don't know if he wants to take it or not. We don't know. Will he, if the Red Sox and the Dodgers offer the exact same money in free agency, we don't know what he will do. And we don't know how the Red Sox like. So I think people are just kind of like, working under the assumption that Mookie Betts is re-signing here by next off season. And if you right. trade him now, you're losing him for the future. 
I don't think there's any difference in a chance of Mookie Betts signing here if the Red Sox trade him now, reset the tax, and then go after him as a free agent versus if they just sign him, try to sign him to extension after the year, or right. they try to re-sign him after the year. I don't think there's any difference based on, yeah. I think there could be a slight difference, and, and let me make a point, because I've said in the past that to me, at least as a fan, what I would prefer is they keep Mookie Betts and re-sign him. Because you're the Boston Red Sox, you're one of the highest spending teams in baseball, that is what you do when you develop one of the top five players in the game. Exactly. Right, and I get that argument, but there is the realist argument, and this I have always agreed with, is that there is a trade, there are many trades, that make it worth moving Mookie Betts. Yeah. And the reason last episode, the episode we talked about it, not last episode. No, it's back in the fall. It was in December. Or was it in December? Okay. I think it was December. I think it was pre-winter meetings, though. Yeah, maybe it was November. The yeah. reason that we didn't think they would move him, or that we decided, that the conclusion we reached is they would probably not move him, is that that's a lot to get in return for a player who... People forget this piece of it, too. The team trading, because there's also, there, there have been plenty of responses to tweets I've done to, and, and posts on our forum, Ian, that are like, you might not re-sign him, just trade him for a really good trade package. The team trading for him is now not only acquiring a player with the risk that he's going to walk in a year, mm-hmm. they are giving up good value to get him. Yes. So they, and meanwhile... It's not like the Red Sox aren't going to compete this year. They, by all indications, they are going. To. They want to compete this year. Yeah, they're not punting on 2020. There are people saying that you just punt and trade everybody. Well, okay, if you blow the team up like that, it's kind of hard to put it back together that quickly. And before anyone says, well, the 2013 team, the 2013 World Series team was a complete fluke. Everyone performed at their like 80th percentile projection, like or or higher. Hundred, you mean yeah, higher yeah. or higher. I mean like David Ortiz basically willed them to the damn World Series in that series. Yeah, the team fell complete. People forget the team fell completely apart in the World Series, and if it weren't for David Ortiz, they would have gotten swept. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, and like Xander Bogarts, like working long at bats because Will Middlebrooks had forgotten that hit. Anyway. The, the the other piece of it was that Mookie Betts might be worth more to the Red Sox than any other team in baseball for the year 2020, depending on what teams think of the risk there. So that, this is, that's the backdrop of why this is a discussion. But it's not like anyone who's saying the Red Sox have made him, I think it's been reported, have made him several offers, including I think Rob Bradford said one over $300 million. The biggest contract ever signed was Mike Trout was what, 10 360 is his extension. Betts is well within his right since he's negotiating with every other team to ask for more than that. Yeah, he might he, he might get four hundred. There's a non chance. There's a non zero chance he does get more than that. Yeah, and so anyone who's saying the Red Sox are cheap by offering him like a ten year, three hundred million plus dollar extension is that's ludicrous. That's not cheap. That's no. That's a that's a fair offer, but he, it's also perfectly fair for him to say no. Yeah, like, that's that's a Davis reasonable. Team. How much do you want to stay in Boston? This gets you paid with a pat capital P. Yeah. But you're well yeah. within your rights to say no. Exactly. Because we're and not offering you full value right now. Yeah. And so if the Red Sox think, let's just say hypothetically, that there's a they have a 20% chance to re-sign him. Yep. Let's just say that's the number. Because he's able to negotiate with any team. And frankly, there are other teams who are in a better cap situation, better weather. There's other advantages that other teams have that they can offer state income tax, other things like that. And if they offer similar money, there's no guarantee he's going to pick the Red Sox. So, yeah, you compete better. You have a chance to be competitive in 2020. But are you better than the Yankees right now? I don't think so. Are you better than the Twins right now? I don't I think, think so. I think they're competing for the wild card right now. Are you better than the uh, Astros right now? Probably not. Are you better than the Indians right now? You're probably competing with, like, the Indians, the Rays in, for the wild card. Yep. Without Mookie Betts, I still think you're competing for the wild card. I don't think it, like, yes, he obviously makes them worse. But as you said, you're not punting the entire season. No. And then you have – what you do gain is you have chips that are basically your insurance that Mookie Betts – okay, let's say he doesn't resign or he does, they don't try to sign him in the offseason. He goes somewhere else. 
if he was going to do that anyway and he walks away and you get one stinking draft pick, you, yeah. your team is in big, big trouble because they do not have the depth in the system to make up for the loss of him walking away after this year. And they the different, don't. yeah, the difference between this and like letting Johnny Damon walk, letting Pedro Martinez walk, letting Jacoby Ellsbury walk. When Johnny Damon walked, they went and got Coco Crisp and Jacoby Ellsbury was coming up. Yeah. When Ellsbury walked, they had Good. Jackie Bradley coming up. You had right. Mookie Betts coming up Mookie, eventually. Right, but it's like yeah. at those times they had the system. Right now, is it an improving system? Oh, yes. yeah. Yes. Uh, there is no one in the system right now, no position player, for example, since we're talking about Betts. Even Casas, because he's so far away. He's not going to be up to the big leagues until 2021 at the earliest, 2022 more likely. If, he, if he's up in 2021, it means that he's – a top yeah. 15 prospect in baseball right. because he's it's, pr- it's probably 2022. Let's it's be probably realistic. 2022 and like during the season, not opening day. Yeah, yeah, correct. There's no one who I would bet on like a significant amount of money to become a major league regular. The only one I think, or the one who has the best chance is Dahlbeck. Well, it's Dahlbeck, Duran, but, Chatham. But, but none of those guys have the Ugo. upside. None of those guys are like... I don't see any – like I think Duran, best case, is like a five. He's like a solid regular. They don't have – like they've had in the past like when they had Devers coming up. They had Bogarts. They had There's Moncada no before he straight. They always had guys who I would have projected who you could see as like future all-stars. Like they don't have anyone in the high minors who projects like that. And they even though have, Casas is a stud, I mean he's a consensus top 100 guy. The top 100 lists have been coming out. He's been consistently – in scouts the top love him. I mean, let's be honest. The scouts speak so glowingly about Casas. The, the top 100 right. lists that have come out recently that matter all have him in like the 70s range. Yeah. Right. And I think it's all because he was first base. If he played anywhere else, he'd be much higher. But it's they knock him for defense. Right. Because I think that's a positional a value, which is fair. Right. But like Casas is a potential like cornerstone lineup piece. Other than that, Dahlbeck's probably, I think, a six hitter. Like they just don't have those upside guys. And while the odds are you might not get those upside guys in the bets trade, what you're going to get is you're going to get guys to fill the void so you can spend on other guys to fill to bring it. You can bring in another superstar because you reset the cap right. and bring in these other guys and you have, you know, three, four additional pieces at the minimum or in arbitration years on your roster now filling those holes that instead of playing paying Brock Holt five million dollars, you have this player making five hundred thousand. Right. And so right. that's why, like they're discussing it and why I think that we've probably gone from maybe let's say there was a 25% chance earlier in the off season. I think right now, I don't know. I guess it seems like based on the rumors, we're looking at 50, 50 chance he gets traded. Sounds something right. around that. And I think it's pretty clear now after today's transactions that it's one of two teams. It's the Dodgers or the Padres. Would you agree? Fill me in. What are today's transactions? Starling Marte got traded to the Diamondbacks. Oh, right, 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 right. right. So the Diamondbacks are out. It, cause, cause, uh, cause, Ken Rosenthal in his article just mentioned that the three AL West teams were the ones that were most interested in bets. It was the Dodgers, Diamondbacks, NL Padres, and L West, sorry. And the Diamondbacks went out today and got Starling Marte for two yeah. high upside prospects. High upside, but far away. I like that deal for Right. Me. And but that's and I like the deal for the Pirates too, because they get big guy, big yep. upside guys. And the Diamondbacks farm system's loaded. They dealt from positions of depth where they have better prospects ahead of them. But those are right. two guys, if you're the Red Sox, I don't think they would be interested in for bets. And I don't think they are based on what the rumored trade packages are because those guys are all in short season ball. They like want the Red guys Sox, that are closer. And I think that brings us – that's probably yeah. a good transition, Ian. So that was what what we, I, that's where I was going. Yeah. That, what we did is we each took a team. Um, and do you want to like flip a coin or something or do you want to just go first or – um, I don't care. Yeah, I can go first. Um, all right. So we did. How many trades do you have? Because I have four. Although one is just kind of a spitballing. Um, I have. I mean, I can. I have like. So I have one, and then we, it's like three vari. There's four variations of it. Basically, I have two of the same pieces in every trade. Yeah. So so baseball trades values dot com has a trade simulator. This is more for fun. We're not trying to say this is a scientific exercise. No, but the, this is we just tried to around. do it within reason based on the names that have been thrown out in the various right. reports from right. Alex and Knowing Kevin what's available. and Dennis Lynn and stuff. Exactly. And they do an interesting thing where they kind of rank guys based on how available they are. Like, for example, with the Dodgers, you can't even do a trade involving Cody Bellinger. Like, yeah. it won't even let you because it's like there's no chance they're moving him. Yeah, it's the Padres have tattoo tattoos. It's the same thing. Exactly. 
So, and that makes sense. But then, like, you know, the next guy, so they, you know, they, they have trade values where they go low, median, high. Um, and, um, you know, that's the value of, I think, of their current deal, basically, uh, of their current contract, because you can't assume, uh, you know, before people bring up the Paul Goldschmidt deal, Goldschmidt said he was open to signing an extension. That has value. Correct. Betts has said he has no interest in signing an extension. That decreases his trade value, Correct. right? Cody Bellinger's trade value on this is like rank is a one thirty three point one. Betts is is like fifty point seven. It's Tatis not because is, Tatis is one thirty seven, right? And it's not he's saying a, he's two that, years closer in ARB, or it's two more years of team control of Bellinger. That's exactly. why Bellinger. Yeah, Bellinger's got four. Yeah, and it, what it is is that they're not saying that those players are like nearly three times as good as bets they're saying that's, that's their value in a deal well um, i think that was reflected if you look at like fan graphs as a really interesting like trade value piece in the off season yep and bets is like way down the list this year for those reasons plummeted. you said yeah he's in like the 30s or the 40s is so, he even on the list i believe he was i, I thought think he, he was, was in the, the back end. he might not have made the list no he was he fell off the list okay that's i think he was, was in the 30s last year Gotcha. Because he only had two years left. Yeah. So anyway, and but he was going to get paid. That's the other thing, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, like the team control aspect is just very important. But the, and that's why, like, I think both of our deals, like, and in my deals, I have five guys coming back to the Red Sox. Yeah. Well, and why don't you go ahead? Because I know there was there was one with the Padres that it's kind of funny. I don't know if you caught this on the forum. You texted me a, a potential deal, and you said, "Would they take it or not?" Someone in our forum put together basically the same deal without the draft pick. Well, so the thing that I think is pretty – it's pretty clear that Will Myers – in any Padres deal, Will Myers is coming back. Because of their their own CBT situation. Yes. And Will Myers, if we want to talk about Betts' deal, Will Myers is worth more negative than Betts is positive. And this is why if you do a deal with the Padres, you're probably getting a little more than potentially you would with the Dodgers because you have to take on this Will Myers contract. Well, which not is, the whole thing, part of it. Part of it, which I'll get to, yep. but it's it's such a negative asset that the Padres would have to compensate you for that, right? And so the other person that I think that I think it seems pretty likely if it's a Padres deal is going to be in the deal is Luis Camposano. Camp, Campusano. Campusano. I don't know. He's their top catching prospect. He's a consensus top seventy five ish prospect, yep. seventy five range. Yeah, he's one of the top five catching prospects in baseball. More of a hit than over defense, but it's pretty clear in both trades the Red Sox want a catching prospect. I mean, and doesn't everyone? But yeah, but um, it's pretty. But with the Padres, they have five guys that I don't see any way they trade in Mackenzie Gore, CJ, uh, CJ Abrams, Luis Patino, and Taylor Trammell. Excuse me, four guys. Patino, Sorry. yeah. Well, because yeah. because Camposano, it's weird. Like there was something saying they weren't going to trade their top five guys, but then everyone's still talking about Camposano, even though yeah, and like everything is guy. reported that like everyone's saying like he's fine to be traded. So that's why I included him. Cause he's, it's pretty clear yeah. the Red Sox are going to want one legit prospect. And that's who I have coming. And I think one thing that people need to, to remember is like the Padres number 10 prospect will probably be like the Red Sox number three prospect or number two prospect. Like when we're talking about ranking in, in, in like context of a specific system, you can't, it's not apples to apples when comparing it with the Red Sox system. So just cause a guy is the Padres number 12 prospect doesn't mean he would be the Red Sox number 12 prospect. So right. I think that's one thing you need to keep in mind. Right. Then the other thing it seems the Red Sox want is they want major league or close to major league ready pieces. And the Padres happen to have a major log jam in the outfield. Um, so the person, the three guys that it seems like it would be, they'd be picking from are Trent Grisham, Manuel Margot, and uh, Josh Naylor. And right. if I'm the Red Sox, I want Grisham. I think he's the most interesting to me. Um, he's a big on base guy. He had a very good year last year in AAA. He's still got six years of team control. I mean, he's clearly the best option of the three, in my opinion. And, yeah, and in terms of the the money working with using this Trade Values website, he's a reasonable ask. The next thing it seems that the Red Sox would want would be a starting pitcher. And this is also, like, this is piggybacking off Kevin Acey's reporting in the San Diego something. But he's Uh, mentioned that the Red Sox Sox wanted two major leaguers in addition to Will Myers and a prospect. So that's where I'm getting these things from. Yep. And, and these are young, controllable major league assets. Correct. And the Padres have a ton of these. And then and, and in, Grisham, but, just to give people the heads up, they just acquired him from the Brewers for Luis Urias this offseason. Yes. No, no, was it Urias? No. It was Urias and Urias, Eric Lauer. Yeah. And they got Zach Davies back Eric also. Lauer, that's right. Okay. Yep. Um, but anyway. Trent so, Grisham is the former Trent Clark. 
Yes, correct. Okay. Um, and then the other piece, it seems, if the Red Sox, pretty obviously, they need starting pitching depth. It's not a surprise to anyone. And the Padres happen to have a bunch of young, interesting starting pitchers. You're not going to get any of the top guys, as we said, the Gore, Gore Paddock, Patino, but, or Lamette, Patino. but I think Patino. But I think there's a chance, like, if you could get one of Joey Lucchesi or Cal Quantrill. Mm-hmm. Which and could. I would personally go with Lucchesi. Really? Um, yeah, I, it, it's an interesting debate because Quantrill has six years of control versus Lucchesi is only four. But Lucchesi mm-hmm. was worth almost three wins last year. Like, right. he's a pretty good pitcher. And right. we, were t- we were talking about a little before we recorded. The splits on Quantrill really scare me. He gets <laughs> murdered by lefties. Like, absolutely destroyed to the tune of last year in 270 uh he faced 270 lefties and they hit 290 354 494 against him that's a bad that's like an all-star line and then you compare that with righties who hit 217 243 337 so he destroys righties Mm -hmm. so um I would personally go with Lucchesi, even though it would be very strange because it would give I would it would give them five lefties in the rotation Oh wow! I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, so <laughs> that would be a little weird, but like, he well, was wait, very... hold on, because you're what do you, you? They have five starters. No, they don't. Yeah, they do. Oh yeah, um, no, give them four lefties. Sorry, I'm a, one of Luchasi or Perez would be the fifth starter. So, okay. yeah, if it's, if it's if Perez is the one righty, right? Because no, Evaldi's Perez... the righty. Evaldi's the righty. You're right. Yeah. So the trade that I that I came up with, and it actually works with the math, was Campus was Myers, Campusano, Grisham, Lucchesi, and then for the last piece, I think the Red Sox. If I'm them, I ask for that 35th pick, and I think I valued that. At I took someone who so the the Padres last year took uh, Hudson Head in like at like the 40th pick last year, and he's valued at three in this trade thing. So I just added him in to like balance things out. And it gets them to about 30 okay. total value if you're including the draft pick and the four players. Okay. And it's 30 because Myers is negative 55. And this is where the you'll see the math gets weird is the Padres bets is supposed to be worth 50. Um, what is that? His trade value is 50.7 MTVs, like millions of dollars or whatever. And um, there's a there's a gap of 20. But you have to consider MTV that is median trade value. Excuse me. Median trade value. In millions of dollars. Is, Yes, Betts is his 50. 50 points. There's a, yeah. there's, there's a 20 million, 20 MTV difference there, but you have to factor in that the biggest haggling point with the Padres right now seems to be Will Myers' contract. Yep. And so that's assuming you're paying all of Will Myers' contract, which is pretty clear the Red Sox won't do. No, and, so, and the Padres don't expect them to do. Yeah, so right now it seems like the Padres want to pay a quarter of it. The Red Sox want them to pay a half. And so if you break that nice and split that down the middle and have – the Padres pay a third of the contract, that number is about 19 MTV removed from Myers negative, which puts it at about 50 for 50. So okay. right on the number. Yeah. So, and then any variation of the deal with the Padres, I would assume is just going to be like a different outfielder from that trio I mentioned. And then a different starter between like Lucchesi, Quantrill, Michael. So Baez. one, one last time just with, with the, the trade is bets. That is who? Will Myers, uh, Trent Grisham, Joey Lucchesi, Luis Camposano, and the 25th, 35th pick in their, their competitive balance A pick in next year's draft. So Camposano goes to double A. He's their number two prospect for me. Uh, number one for me, I think. I, I need to look at it, but I, uh, yeah, he's one or two. Blush, it's, he's number it's, one. It's clear me. he's clear one. Clear top two. Clear, yes, no question. Correct. No question above Mata, Dahlbeck, whoever I you want to put there. I don't think Grisham is prospect eligible. Let me check. They, oh, no. I was thinking of uh, Verdugo. I was surprised was still eligible. Uh, I don't think Grisham Yeah, no. Grisham is not no. prospect eligible. But I'm saying, so Grisham... Becomes is, your everyday Becomes your everyday fielder. right, right left fielder? fielder? Left fielder? Right fielder, probably. You're right. Right fielder, because they're not going to yeah. move... Yeah, you're right. I forgot Ben Intendi. I was thinking Ben Intendi goes to center, but Bradley's still on the team. Yeah, Bradley's situation. still on the team here in this. Myers is your first baseman. Yep. Um, Pushes Shavis to utility and field where I like him. He plays. You know, yep. he'll start like five games well, a week. I mean, it, then I mean, you're 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 doing a very raised thing on the right side of the infield between Shavis, Peraza, Myers. They're all righties is the only issue. But yeah, that's true. They'll, they have to find a lefty at some point. But yeah. yeah. But then, and then Luchesi battles with Perez for the fifth starter role. And let's be honest, with the injury concerns in the Red Sox rotation, the they odds are they're going to beat all of them. I mean, and so, yeah. with a guy like Luchesi or Perez, you can swing Manum and 
you know, yeah. do like what they did with like Hector Velasquez in 2018. And like, you're not going to obviously get like equal value, but in terms of like war projections, if I'm going off of steamer this year, okay. Buczeski is projected at 2.3. Um, Grisham is projected at, sorry, I just have to bring it up. Grisham is projected at 1.6. So you're looking at what? 3.3, 3.9 from those two. I think Will Myers is negative, but, um, Myers is projected at 0.2. So you're looking at about four and a bit. So you're looking at getting back about four and a half war for this year. And obviously going out bets is worth what eight, I think projected. Yeah. Something like that. So you're obviously losing, but it's, I'm looking right now. It, you're losing you're you're losing value. No one's disputing that for this year. But I think long term, you know, you get three guys who are under team control, not including Myers. That's a, a steamer six. projection is six point six. Okay, so it's six point six versus about four point two, four point three. But the but the thing is it's that, you know, it's it's six point six from one position versus four point two well, from it, like three. Exactly. But still like it, it it would improve the Red Sox depth and all those guys are locked up going forward is the key right. to me. And right. you get the pick. So that was what I came up with, basically. Right. Okay. So that's where you came in came in at on your first deal. First deal that I'll look at with the Dodgers, and you're probably I don't know if you'll like where I went with this. The first thing I looked at was the the Dodgers present situation in the outfield. They have a full outfield. Um, they've got uh, right now on, on roster resource on fan graphs, their, their outfield from left to right is Jock Peterson and left Cody Bellinger in center and Alex Verdugo in right, um, with AJ Pollock on the bench with his large deal for a, you know, fourth outfielder, which is kind of what he is in this lineup. Although I'm sure they'll do things like, you know, move guys around the infield that this, this has Corey Seager at short, um, didn't they? Did, I thought they got. Oh, yeah, this has Corey Seager at short and Gavin Lux at second. It would probably go the other way, right? Um, no, I don't think Lux is a very good defender. Okay, but Lux can play short, um, and they've got guys they can play at second. I mean, in their projection right now, they've got Chris Taylor and Kiki Hernandez, guys who play on their bench. So, you know, I saw Seager's a guy whose name we've heard thrown around that they might move in the right deal. Um, so he was a guy I was looking at. Pollock was a guy I was looking at who, you know, the Red Sox don't have a fourth outfielder right now and they could use a starting outfielder, frankly. And I, I, you know, Pollock on steamer, I mean, Pollock's projection is 1.3 war bounce back candidate, man, maybe like the outfield version of a, of a Will Myers. So what I looked at is I, I did a deal where I took Pollock, who's got a negative 25 million median trade value uh, on this. Um, Seager, who's got a 52.1 trade value. His, his value is very close to bats. Um, Jeter Downs, uh, second base prospect, um, has a 21.7 uh, million trade value. He is ranked by Baseball America as their number six prospect. He's a shortstop. Um, had a really good year last year. Uh, I am assuming, like you did, that the top of their farm system is not available. So I'm assuming Gavin Gavin Lux is not available. I am assuming Dustin May is probably not available. Um, but they also have near MLB ready pieces like the Padres do. Um, going Pollock Seager Downs that gets you to a 48.5 million dollar value. Um, Pollock is signed through 2022 with a player option at an average annual value of 12 million. So that gets 15 million off the books for this year. Doesn't get you under the CBT, but maybe you can try and move pieces mid season. If you fall out of contention, um, I think they would need to do other moves to get under. Maybe you can get the Dodgers to pay down some of Pollock's deal. Who knows? Um, would that get you close? If in, uh, and by Seeger is in his second year of arbitration, so he's only got two years left. Is the other problem with this? So you're not really getting a long term asset. Is is kind of the downside on getting Seeger? Um, maybe you can try to extend him. Who knows? Um, you get forty eight point five million doing it that way. If the Red Sox were to take Kiebert Ruiz, uh, catching prospect who if the who the Dodgers have and is somewhat expendable potentially because they have Will Smith. 
um, as their potential catcher of the future. Um, those, you know, that that's kind of if you do Ruiz instead, that's fifty point two million. Um, that gets you close. I don't know what you think of those deals, Ian. Pollock, Seager, and either Downs or Ruiz. If I'm the Red Sox, I am pushing to get Verdugo. Well, that's what I was gonna go to next, actually. So I guess that that would be my because, like, I I think I like Seager, but and I like his left handedness. Yep, but. I'm not sure. Like he would out, he would be playing second base, and I'm not sure that they would want to get someone with only two years of control because that yeah. kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah. So Verdugo is uh, worth fifty million uh, in in this trade scenario. Um, so if you substitute Verdugo, worth a little bit less than Seager, I think it's a better fit for the Red Sox. Um, Pollock, I guess, becomes your fourth outfielder in that scenario. Um, with Jeter Downs and like was he Double A? Um, well, and Ruiz is Double A or Triple A? Yeah, yeah. Because the one the one I came up with just looking at it would be Pollock for Dugo and then one of Ruiz or Downs. Right, that's what I'm saying. That's yeah, what, that's what the trade was that I had with Seager. And if you just yeah. substitute Verdugo in there for Seager, they're about worth the same. Exactly. Um, the The other thing too that's interesting is that Verdugo and Seager are worth in this trade scenario about what Betts is worth. Would you make the deal straight up for Verdugo? No, I'd rather him either. for one year and let him walk away and take the pick. I wouldn't either. Yep, that's. I mean, because there's again, there's there's it's it's value now, and it's not like you're giving up value in later years. Like you can still acquire that some other way, drafting or or trading other players. Um, but yeah, I mean, Pollock, Verdugo, or Seager, and then Downs or Ruiz gets you to about the the number in this. Um, what else did you have? Did you have any other ones? I have, no, I have my, one my, mine were all just variations of what I said with okay. the different outfielders. With the different so, outfielders and stuff. And the yeah. different starting pitchers. And the, so it's just not, yeah. The other one that I did that was interesting is what if you went for no A.J. Pollock, Major League Ready slash Prospect Poo Poo Platter. Okay. And so I went with what if they did bets for right-hander Tony Gonsolin, who's worth $19.3 million in the, the trade calculator. Jock Peterson, who's worth twelve point seven million. Problem there is either him or Ben Tendi has to play right, which is probably the downside of this deal. No, no, no. Jock Peterson can play first base. Yeah, but then who plays right? Uh, I don't know. You got to go get a right right fielder. I forgot AJ Pollock's not involved, so yeah, you're right. No AJ Pollock. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could add AJ Pollock, and then because if you put Pollock in, you put Bradley in right, and then Pollock plays center. I would play Brad- Pollock in right. Bradley's got the better arm. That was the only thing I was thinking uh, of. Yeah, I guess. I guess that's true. But uh, if it ain't broke, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, but if you did Gonsolin, Peterson, and Diego Cartaya, who's their number seventh ranked prospect, a catcher, lower lower down than Kiber Ruiz, not quite as good of a prospect. Maybe they're more likely to part with him. Those three players get are worth in this calculator forty seven point four million. I think then you toss in a low level prospect. Or two, probably two. Um, that might get you there. Maybe the better way to do it, I kind of like where you're going with this, and maybe I'll just do this really quick, is if you did Gonsolin, Peterson, so Ver, get rid of Verdugo. Um, I gotta, so add Pollock. Trade two Red Sox. Get rid of Verdugo. Come on, there we go. No. Ah. Damn sticky keys. From the computer. Get your mind out of the gutter, people. Um, all right. So if you went Gonsolin, Young Jock, Cartaya, that gets you to $22.1 million. So you've still got $28 million to play with. One I just came up with, which I don't think there's any way the Dodgers would do, would be Breeze, Downs, Gonsolin, Gonsolin, Peterson, and Pollock. Because that's 51.8 versus 50.7 for bets. But I just do not see any way they would give up. Ruiz, Ru- Downs, and Peterson, and yeah. And Gonsolin. They'd and give Gonsolin. me three prospects and two big leaguers. That just doesn't make sense to me. 
Yeah, that'd be that but seems heavy. In, that's why this thing is obviously the science is inexact with these right. numbers. Like right. I just I think that's very steep. I I honestly Josiah think, Gray maybe. Yeah, Dude. I like him actually. But if I'm the if I honestly think that the best the Dodgers offer that would be the most likely would be a very clean just bats for Verdugo and Kyber Ruiz. You think that? I mean, you think they would give them both up though? I think you. I it depends. Know. So here's the thing, right? The Dodgers have gotten so close. They've got a closing window. Yeah. You've got an ba- aging Kershaw. They have to pay Bellinger in two years. Yeah. I, I mean, their window's closing. Oh, no, they, they don't have to pay Bellinger in two years. I made that up. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no. no yeah, they, they they've got, yeah, he's four years in. Or did oh, he he's sign four, an extension? No, no, no. no he's, he's got four years of control remaining. Oh, that's four years of control remaining, right? Okay, yeah. You're right. Yeah, and you've got Bueller on four years. You've got Bellinger on four. They're years. they're right in their window. It's the next three years or so. Yeah, and because you've got Seager for two more years. You've got you know, like I said, you've got an aging Kershaw. Yeah, you've got like Kenta Maeda's in his thirties. Jock Peterson's a year left. Like yeah, but Maeda, you know, I, I thought about seeing a deal. What would deal would look like if they sent Price as well? Yeah. You know, just to you know, go all in on getting under the cap, and then see what you get back. But the problem with that is that in this price is price and bets are worth negative four million. Yeah, cause because price, price is, is such deal. a negative. Yeah, and you know, look, this is not the Nick Punto trade where the Dodgers have all like have now tripled their budget, have yeah. all kinds of money in, to spend, and will spend it to get a Mexican superstar. Yeah, so you know, I just think that. So that did, that didn't really work because I was yeah. think I was gonna go like with the crazy you know deal. What does that look like? And I just don't. I don't see it. Yeah, I just think that when I look at it, I think that the Dodgers offer is cleaner because you don't have to pick up like a Will Myers type contract. You don't have to take on Pollock. They can do no, it without Pollock. Exactly. That's they my, could that. give you the prospect poo poo platter. Yeah, and like that could be interesting, but it's <laughs> I. Like I like if if you told me that the package that I just did the Downs Gonsolin Peterson Pollock Ruiz something along yeah it's fifty one point eight versus okay. fifty point seven if you told me that that was like a legit thing I would take that over the Padres offer that I put together oh for sure but otherwise like I think I might take if that the Padres thing I put together because I just like the balance you get where you get yeah. the two big leaguers well, you get the prospect you, and the pick which that pick thirty five is worth like. Two million dollars, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, if you get Gonsolin, no. he slots in your major league rotation, or do you, do you start him in Pawtucket? Uh, he probably slots in as in like he's in competition for the number five. He's your right. number six starter. Peterson would be an everyday guy. Pollock would be an everyday guy. Ruiz starts in Triple A. Down starts in Double A. Yeah, that sounds right. But like, I don't think you're getting all that. Is my point. Like, you, no. you and if you take off one of those prospects, I don't love taking on Pollock because Peterson's a one year rental, more or less. Like. I just That's think the problem the, with Peterson. I just think the Padres deal just gives them more both now and in the future. Because another thing with Will Myers, like I know he was terrible last year, but like Will Myers was a positive WAR player back. You know, 2016 he was almost a four WAR player. Last year he was 2017 he was 2017 and 2018 he was really positive WAR offensively, very negative defensively, which is mm-hmm. what caused it to slip. And then last year he was just awful all around. Right. But, like, if you can get Will Myers back to what he was, his swing in Fenway is very interesting. And like, yeah, he's going to have to exercise the demons of the ALDS and Well, exactly. But, like, but. As, if he's someone who you can play him at first base and in the outfield and, like, a in-between role, it's three more years. Like, and if they're paying some of it down and then you're also getting, you know, a guy like Lucchesi and one of the outfielders who can help you this year and then you're getting a – a top high end catching prospect and a high draft pick. I think you kind of have to do that trade, but I don't think that's, I'm not clear. It's not clear to me. That's what's on the table, but based on the reporting, it seems like it's in the ballpark. I would say, I guess, but I mean, if you look at the pot at the Dodgers, I mean, if you can get a Verdugo, yeah, that's the difference. If you get a Verdugo, that's the type Verdugo is the type of player who could put up like a four war season this year, or a three, not a four necessarily, but like a three war season this year, this year. No, no, yeah. yeah. This year he can help make up for bets and right. And if you get a Gonsolin who's going to pitch better than your rather sixth starter, right? Yeah. I mean, who the hell is the sixth starter right now? 
uh, Kyle Hart. I'm like not kidding. Yeah, I mean it's it's either Hart or like Velasquez, Hector Velasquez, maybe yeah. Hauk. Yeah, maybe Daniel McGrath if he like if he proves last year but was the mirage. He's not on the roster the forty. I'm just going off. I the mean, 40s. he's got an NRI. I'm saying. I mean, but, but going on the forty, it's either Velasquez or Hart. Right, but I'm saying they. I mean, again, Ryan Weber is still on the forty. Sure, <laughs> like there, sure, sure, there's sure. fungible depth on the depth on the forty. Right, of course, but um, so that's why I just. I mean, they're going to have to at least lose. You know, they can't carry all of the forty man relievers who don't have options probably into the season unless someone's hurt. So I would say that in terms of like high level prospect depth, I, I like what the Dodgers have to off have to offer more in terms of guys in double or triple A with like that from that Downs, um, Kyber, Gonsolin, Josiah Gray, all that crew is double or triple A. Or the majors, I guess. So, I like, mean, so if you if you trade for a catcher who's going to be up next year or the year after, right? Christian Christian Vasquez is around because you signed him to this extension. I guess only through twenty twenty one. And there's a is that a player option or a team option? That's a team option in twenty twenty two for seven million. I guess that's affordable. I guess yeah. you could move him, or I guess you can just have like Ruiz ready to take over in twenty twenty two, or no, split the just, job. You need, you need two catchers. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I'm just saying, like they could. Well, I'm just saying, you know, if you've got two starter starter level catchers, moving one of them makes sense. Oh yeah, like so. given the given catching depth in the game. Uh-huh. But that said, let's not count our chickens. We did that with well, like, no. Swihart and Christian Vasquez, and look how exactly. That but I just think that like I think in. The Dodgers' prospects interest me more, given who we know from the Padres is off the table. But if we're talking about like a more like wider depth package that can help them both near term and long term, I think the Padres have a little more to offer given that pick. The pick is the wild card to me because the Dodgers don't have that. Yeah, like, I would still take a Dodge. I mean, the, I think, like you said, given who is likely off the table for both teams, right? So the Padres have the better system. Yeah, but the Padres' top five is com- four. Top four is but completely the top four the are on the table, so that doesn't matter. Yeah, the, they both have guys to offer in that back end of a top one hundred slash just missed window. Yes, I just like the Dodgers' variation of those better than the Padres. I one. do too, and I think that if you can get a Verdugo, or even if you can find a way, like, well, I mean, here's the thing we we're going to mention right on the front page right now of baseballtradevalues.com, dot com. There's a, a three way deal that someone did. Where the Red Sox trade bets to um, the Dodgers in exchange for Corey Seager, and then package Seager and Jaron Duran to the Reds for Nick Senzel. I wouldn't do that, but the numbers work. Ish. Yeah. Yeah. Um. You know who knows? Um, right. Someone there's... did. Someone did a three way. Another three way with the Reds. This is insane this one's ludicrous yeah yeah i'm not even gonna that doesn't even it's no point yeah yeah that's but i think i think i think the thing that we need to watch is a mystery team are we gonna get a hashtag mystery team coming in who would it even be i don't know the reds i have no idea the reds already have 12 outfielders so it wouldn't be them i don't think um and and five third basemen the cardinals maybe I don't know. There's just the, the Diamondbacks would have been the perfect mystery. Well, exactly. But they're exactly. done. Like they, 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 they got Starling Marte today. Right. So I, there, I like. think it's it's it, for me it's the Padres Dodgers are nothing. I think it's one of those two where he doesn't get dealt. And right. right now, like maybe we could I don't know if we want to do this, put a poll up, put our best two trade proposals up on the on the on Twitter and people. Yeah, let's vote. do that. That'd be that would be interesting. And we can see what we'll the, put it up when this podcast report. comes out. But um, I, yeah. I think I would lean towards the Padres one. Just I, I really like getting like the Campusano and then the pick gives you two legit prospects because the 35th pick going off last year was worth like about one point five million. That's a legit when you combine that with the fact that what do they also have the 18th pick? I think I want to say the Padres. No, no. The Red Sox will also have. the Oh, 18th pick. yeah. 18, I think. So if you have 18, 35 and then a second round pick is going to be what? 50 something you're not speaking to the mic i know i'm, I'm just talking to myself MLB. okay uh, but yeah so something in like the fifth, late 40s early 50s like yeah. you can add a lot of talent with those picks 
that's three picks before they made more or less in the same time they made one this year. <laughs> so like, and you're getting the extra bonus money to distribute. Okay, so down. The Red Sox so, are picking 17th, 17th. Okay. 17th. Yeah. So they have 17 and then what's their second round pick? I, I don't know. I only, Oh, it's not set yet. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Cause not all the free agents have signed. Right. But it, it'll be in like the early, it'll be in the mid forties about probably mid forties, early fifties. Yeah. Like, that's with that Campusano and then two major league pieces and Myers or three major league pieces. That's a pretty interesting trade to me. And it doesn't. Yeah. As I said, I don't think it's that unrealistic. Whereas the Dodgers ones that I like, I think are unrealistic, if that makes sense. Mm. 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 So maybe we'll see. Well, we'll put a poll up. That's a good call. And I like that. Thank you. Um, we do have one email. Let's get to it real quick. Um, our patron, Bill Stanton, Sent us last year. He had sent us his under twenty one minor league lineup. Mm-hmm. Um, this year, he says, uh, "I did this last year. It feels thinner this year." So his lineup, he goes Tristan Casas at first, obviously. Um, Sedan Rafaela at second. Don't know if I agree there. Um, shortstop Matthew Lugo. I think that's a foregone conclusion. Third base Anthony Flores. Catchers Jack Scroshans. Left field Nick Decker. I would put him in right. Um, center field, Hilberto Jimenez, right field, Daryl Belen, and uh, DH appears to be Brian Gonzalez. He just says Gonzalez. I'm assuming that's who he means. Um, yeah. That does feel thin. I don't know if that's who I would go with. Is that who you – I mean, obviously, so Casas at first, no question. Yeah. Um. By the way, Brian Mata could pitch for that team still, which seems crazy. Um, Jimenez in center for sure. Um, Lugo at short for sure. Decker and uh-huh. right. Um, I guess Flores is still on that team. Yeah, Flores. I would put right. Flores at second though. Yeah, Flores at second. I would put Howlett at third still. Would you put Howlett at third? We have Rafaela ranked higher, but I think Howlett at third is just a better. I think fit. Howlett has better upside. It, well, it's it, a better it, fit. Yeah, because Rafael, I, I don't think he's. A, I mean, he's teeny like. Well, I mean, he's he more, played a lot of third base in. Um, no, I know in but, the DSL, but but, yeah. I, but honestly, like I think that strikes me as right in like in the general, and I think it maybe it, it seems thinner because it's all international guys. Mm-hmm. But the reason is because they drafted the college guys they drafted are over twenty one or over twenty one. That's why this is kind of arbitrary. Honestly. Exactly. So like guys like but and the other thing is they haven't drafted that many call like last year in the draft they took you know it was Groshans Cannon and like senior signs in the first 10 rounds in terms of position players. So right. Cause, just, cause the young guys were pitchers. You could easily exactly. make an under, that's the thing is you could easily make an, a 21 and under rotation. Right. No question. So, I mean, just take like the low rotation last year and it's better than that lineup. Exactly. Right? I mean, you've got so it's just the Mata big, groom. Um, song is too old, but you've got Mata groom, Zephyr, John, Aldo Ramirez, Chris Murphy, Brian Bayo. Rodriguez, Brian Bayo. Like the pitching is loaded. Yeah. And that's the thing is they've done a much better job these last couple of years of adding pitching talent to the system. And now it's, and that doesn't even include like Chi Jung Lu. Like we haven't even mentioned him in that. Like in terms He's of closing. where's the, the position players have not like yeah, necessarily, they good. haven't spent those resources on position players. Right. Right. So, well, and that's just how it's worked out. Exactly. Um, it's not like, I don't think it's a concerted. No, effort. that's just how the boards have fallen right. or whatever. So yeah. Right. Um, yeah, but thanks for the email, Bill. Uh, and again, if you want to email us, it's podcast at SoxProspects.com. Uh, Ian, I think we might as well wrap up. You got any closing thoughts for the folks? Uh, hopefully this comes out before Mookie Betts gets traded, if he does get traded. <laughs> uh, you can follow Ian at Twitter, at Ian Cundall, I-A-N-C-U-N-D-A-L-L. You can follow me at SP Chris Hatfield. Uh, we'll probably put that poll we talked about on the site Twitter that's at SoxProspects. Uh, as always, want to thank our podcast producer, editor, and guru, Joe Tetral. Thank you, Joe. Podcast Joe 2.0. Uh, again, patreon.com slash Sox Prospects if you want to support uh, the podcast. We appreciate it. If there's a trade, we'll try and do an emergency podcast. I'm mostly around, Ian. Um, who knows if we'll need to or not. We were, we were debating whether or not to hold off on doing this one. I think we just said, for all we know, it's not going to happen, and then, you know. In two weeks, we're going to record a regular one, and they're going to make I mean, trade, just so. based on the forum and Twitter, people are interested in this stuff. So I and think it makes sense to kind of talk it out. It. Yeah. I was interested in getting your thoughts. So, cool. Well, thank you all for listening. Uh, for Ian, I'm Chris. For 
Beefy the Cat you've made in the background. Thank you for listening. We'll be back in your drums soon. In an ocean, baby.